very good afternoon to you all and on behalf of all our team I'd like to welcome you to this Aerospace and Defence Next Generation Leader webinar. This is the second in a series of five webinars covering defence, commercial aerospace, space, the fourth industrial revolution and global challenges. The purpose of these webinars is to give a glimpse of the world post the immediate Covid crisis for technologists, scientists, engineers and other high potential people working in the aerospace and defence sector. And it aims to discuss some of the issues that will influence and shape the world past 2030 and to offer support to the next generation leaders in the sector who will be trying to navigate this future landscape. Firstly, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Paul Heathgate. I'll be involved in moderating this webinar today. I'm an airline pilot currently flying the A380. And for some years now, I've had a keen interest in environmental matters. This has taken me to work with the UK Environment Agency on flooding and coastal defence, and also to the Institute of Aerospace Technology at Nottingham University, where I lecture in aircraft operations and sustainable aviation, and also chair an advisory body there. I've also got a co-moderator uh, with me today, which is Dr. Ema Makalevi. Uh, Ema, I know that we're both very excited to be here today. Would you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ema Makalevi, and I'm a research fellow at Queen's University, Belfast. I'm currently working on proof of concept work where uh, we're trying to use uh, merging technology and multifunctional composites to create commercial products from university research. Um, I'll be working with Paul today uh, during our question session, so please feel free to use the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen during the talks to pose any questions you might have for the panellists and we'll try and get around to them and pose those questions. Thanks. Thank you, Emma. Uh, before we begin, could we just extend our great thanks to the healthcare professionals, essential workers and to many other industry professionals who have stepped up globally to the challenge and helped look after us over the past months. Thank you. Now I think we're moving on to slide two please uh, Shahid. And global aviation is being expected to deliver a 50% reduction in its contribution to global CO2 emissions by 2050. And this from a 2005 start point. Progress is being made, but new initiatives such as tail, uh, zero tailpipe emissions by 2050 will require a series of significant technological breakthroughs. So the subject of our webinar in commercial airspace today is the route to zero emissions, evolution or revolution. And today we will be discussing the obstacles and barriers that must be overcome to accelerate progress and to improve the risk to reward balance for new product development. Why is this important? Well, climate change is a problem that is becoming increasingly concerning to us all. And speaking as an airline pilot, something that I feel we must find a solution to. So what is the pathway to continue to keep the world connected while protecting it for future generations? The commercial aerospace sector is being badly hit in the wake, wake of COVID crisis. There is now, and there will be going forward, tough times to address. But there are signs that governments, particularly in Europe, have drawn a line and insisted to industry that recovery support will depend on and be linked to real progress in reducing environmental impact. We go to slide three, please, Shahid. So new technologies are emerging and we could be entering a new period of great innovation. And so to discuss the challenges and the choices we will face, we've brought together a panel of experts to bring their perspective on the subject. So we've got slide three there. I think if we could remove slide three, please. And then I'd like to hand over to you, Ema, to do the introductions for our panelists, please. Thanks, Paul. Um, today we have Jack Pelton. Jack Pelton is the chairman of the board and the CEO of Experimental Aircraft Association. Prior to this, he was senior VP of engineering before becoming CEO of the Cessna Aircraft Company, where he oversaw a mighty 35 aircraft during a 12 year period. Jack was also Senior VP of Engineering and Programmes at Fairchild Dornier and previously worked at McDonnell Douglas for over two decades. Hi Jack, thanks for coming today. We have Luke Dur Duradouin. Luke recently accepted the position of Chief Executive Officer at HD Manufacturing after retiring from his role as Group Executive Vice President of Megat Aerospace and Defence. Luke has a 30-year career in management and leadership in aerospace, industrial equipment and software industries at McDonnell Douglas, Allied Signal. Honeywell, GKN and Eventsys PLC. 
His corporate career culminated as president of Invenzi's APB, a billion dollar sales for Adam Company with 3,000 employees. Upon retiring from corporate life, Luke spent time as a partner and advisor to private equity firms and founded the Integrity Energy Group and serves in charity and renewable energy and nonprofit organizations. Hi, Luke. Uh, next is Professor Brian Felsen. Brian Felsen is the Head of School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and Professor of Composite Materials and Aerostructures at my very own Queen's University Belfast. He is also a Fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. He previously worked at Imperial College where he first joined as a postdoc before becoming an academic staff member and then spent four years at Monash University in El Melbourne before taking up the Royal Academy of Engineering Bombardier Chair of Aerospace at Composites in Queen's in 2013. Professor Falzen is internationally renowned for his work on analysis, design, manufacture, and testing of advanced aer aero composite structures, and published over 200 reviewed, peer reviewed journal and conference papers and book chapters. Brian. Next, we have Frederick Kampf. Frederick is the Director of Industry Affairs at the Swedish Aviation Group. He previously worked for several years in the Swedish CAA before joining EASA, initially as the agent's. Agency's Deputy Chief Legal Advisor, then the Manager for Agreements and External Representation Section in the International Cooperation Department before moving to his current role. Frederick has a technical background with an upper secondary degree in mechanical engineering and military service as a battalion engineer in the Swedish Armed Forces and is an active pilot in his spare time. Hello, Frederick. And last but definitely not least, we have Hervey Morvan. Hervey is the Chief of Future Platforms at Rolls Royce and a professor at the University of Nottingham. He's an industrial and academic leader in research and technology and future concepts in aerospace focused on future propulsion and energy and power. He is a founder and committee member of the Royal Aeronautical Society Nottingham branch and a fellow of that society as well. He is passionate about technology and innovation and enjoys good food, comic books and his motorbike in his spare time. He shares his time between Nottinghamshire and Shropshire where his partner lives. Thank you, Ima. We are, I can't uh, begin to explain how privileged Ema and I feel that we uh, have had access to talk to you in the preparation of this webinar, panellists. It's been a great pleasure and, and I hope that we can do that preparation justice with uh, the next hour and a half that we're going to be sharing with you. The structure of the webinar is relatively straightforward. We're going to invite the panel to give their views individually and then we will have a group discussion and afterwards we will open up to our invited audience and uh, for a question and answer session. And I would like to, to thank everybody else. I think we've got uh, quite a few people who've joined us today and we really hope that to, we will get some uh, good interactive uh, questions from you as the webinar develops. If you have a look at your screens, you'll see a question and answer button at the bottom. I think it's probably around about here. Um, if you could make your questions through that particular link, I know that will help uh, Ema and myself to uh, run the webinar. The whole webinar is planned to run for an hour and 30 minutes, and I'm now going to call on our first speaker to kick off the proceedings. Brian, again, very good to see you, and thank you so much for being with us today. Would you mind starting our panel presentations for us? Can you confirm that you can see my screen of presentation mode? Yes, we can, Brian. Thank oh. you. Yes, uh, you were unmuted for the introduction. Yes, thank I, I realised that. that. Really? Yeah. But, no, that's good. Thank you. I can hear you now as well. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, um, uh, this afternoon, UK time. Um, I'm going to bring a very um, uh, a particular perspective uh, based on my background uh, in, in advanced composite materials and lightweight structures. And, I, and I'm going to just briefly, in, in a couple of minutes, talk about some of the challenges and opportunities um, that that we um, that we face um, in in um, in, in uh, utilising and further exploiting uh, some of these advanced materials. Now, as uh, Paul has already said, um, we face a, a confluence of factors uh, with this pandemic. If you look at if I refer to um, uh, the graph on the right hand side, uh, air traffic has for the last few decades been doubling every 15 years, approximately. 
And we have all been very confident in that growth continuing. But because of this confluence of factors, unlike any other crises that we've had in recent history, I've put a question mark here because I'm not sure whether that is certainly going to continue. We will certainly see a dip. Um, how that recovers beyond that dip is something that we, um, we, we will await and see. Uh, but as has been mentioned, a lot of government interventions will be required to address some of these issues. Um, but there is a crisis which has preceded this pandemic and will persist beyond it, and that is climate change. And that is why we've had a number of directives from, from uh, intergovernment directives, um, all aimed at reducing emissions. And within the aerospace industry, if we look at the EU flight path document, uh, 2050, um, there are some really ambitious targets here. Um, uh, with respect, for example, to the 2000 baseline, we want to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions by 75% and nitrous oxide emissions by 90%. So that is a good motivation for us as researchers and developers to um, look at uh, weight reduction, uh, look at the introduction of, of advanced materials. So weight reduction will continue to play a key role. But of course, industry is also telling us that they want to reduce development costs, especially the cost of certification, which is particularly expensive when it comes to advanced composite materials. So one way of doing this is to uh, introduce simulation and modeling at all stations of the development cycle. And we have seen um, uh, recent announcements from various uh, uh, governments of various countries that recovery funding linked to uh, post-COVID-19 is very much going to be, uh, going to be uh, linked with climate change targets. The uh, Aerospace Technology Institute here in the UK has issued a number of uh, technology roadmaps and uh, one to do with aerostructures is as you see here. Now we could spend quite a bit of time on this but what I want to draw your attention to is some of the really ambitious targets that have been placed on the structural aspects of aerospace uh, uh, and aircraft development. If you look at airframe weight we are looking at up to a 35% reduction on average in airframe weight between now and 20, 30, 35 plus, which is not that far away. Um, productivity rates will need to increase and, as, and buy to fly ratio will need to be improved. That's basically how much material you bring in to develop your, your, your product and how much actually ends up on the aircraft. So most of you may be familiar with um, uh, the building block, block approach of how we, 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 uh, we, we qualify a, a, a structure for, for certification requirements. And what we are trying to do to reduce that cost of certification is to replace some of the physical testing with simulation. And there's a lot of work being done in this area. With composites, it presents particular problems because it's a fairly new material still. And uh, when we look at um, simulation or certification by simulation, a lot of it has to do with the ability to reliably predict damage in composites and composite structures. Now, um, what you don't want is to, you, you start with very basic testing and then move up the complexity of that pyramid. What you don't want is to have anything go wrong at the very top when you're testing big expensive structures. But of course, we know that that is exactly what happened in 2009 with the Wingflex te uh, test on the Boeing 787. So we want to avoid this sort of thing from happening. Um, there are a number of opportunities and technical challenges which we can discuss um, uh, this afternoon. Um, as I mentioned, uh, predicting damaging composites. We still don't really use them as effectively as we perhaps could. Um, repair is an issue, uh, crashworthiness in terms of uh, even the uh, certification requirements. Are they fit for purpose when it comes to advanced composite materials? There's an issue of expertise in the, in, in the industry and uh, also issues surrounding material characterization. So again, a quick fire overview of, uh, of, of my interest in this space. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Brian. Um, as you can see, Brian's contribution is most relevant as weight is one of the, the enemies to progress in developing new aircraft. 
Um, from my observation, current uh, conventional aircraft designs are based around their landing weight and not their takeoff weight. And interestingly, a, an all electric aircraft actually takes off at the same weight that it lands. And this asks a lot of questions about flight profiles and aircraft structures. Now, I would like to move on to you, Frederick. Thank you for joining us uh, for the webinar today from Sweden. You have some very important observations, not necessarily on the what uh, the industry needs to do, but the hows in navigating a route to near zero emissions. So could you share these with us now, please? Thank you, Paul. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Great. Then, um, yeah, I hope you can hear me well, everyone, and see me as well. I'm calling up from Stockholm. Weather is beautiful this summer, and we are talking about a very, very important issue uh, for aviation, uh, how the future will look like. Uh, I want to also just say that I'm working now for the Swedish Aviation Industry Group as a Director of Industry Affairs. Interestingly, though, that that's a part of the Confederation of Swedish Transport Enterprises, which actually covers all transport modes. So just to say that these challenges are not completely unique to aviation, as we know. Uh, I think most of, if not all, transport modes have to go through this steel bath, bath now to uh, improve our environment and, and uh, reduce the climate effect. Now, in my job, I've been focusing on regulation of aviation. I'm a lawyer at profession, but working also with technical matters and especially aviation safety. And I've done that on national, regional and global levels, which I hope will give us a little bit of uh, context to discuss later on. So I'd like to say a few words. Uh, I will introduce a challenge, the solution and a potential problem, and then a few concluding remarks. The common threat that we have, climate change, is not a small one. It's the one in many uh, people's minds and heads and words. It's a common threat, but do we have common tools? Do we have a common procedure, common mechanism to getting the job done in a fairly short time? That's a huge challenge for all industries, but particularly maybe for the aviation industry, which normally has very long lead times. And we look at material that is in the air for um, good over 20 years or so. But nota bene, if aviation fails this challenge and other transport modes and other parts of society succeed, there might be political implications for us which will actually win clip our industry. And this is a fear greater than any one because we know how much aviation contributes to the global society. So we have other plans of course, we will innovate. And aviation has always been a great innovator, maybe the world leading innovator even. And uh, um, one thing though, we might not always have been so good at telling people how, how excellent our innovation toolbox is and what we have performed, what we have achieved. <clears throat> Given the fan fantastic results of the fuel efficiency, for example, I still have to shake politicians in Sweden to explain to them again and again that we're talking about reductions of 60, 70 or 80 percent of fuel consumption if we look at the first generation of aircraft. But that doesn't solve the problem because aviation is supposed to increase, so we need to do more. I come then to the solution. We have a window of opportunity now in my assessment. Maybe it's 10, 20, 30 years ahead and we've seen the figures already for aviation in uh, 2050 the EU goals uh, and we have this window to develop the new technologies that we need um, to reduce aviation's climate impact but at the same time <clears throat> as we can continue to serve the world and the transport demand of the world with, with aviation in a safe and efficient manner and unfortunately it's not just one technology that we need it's a plethora it's a myriad of technologies it's a myriad at least it's a lot we have to get, um, just as Brian spoke about, we had to look at the materials, get more lightweight in and have a solid testing frames and testing procedure for that. But we need to look at existing technology. So the turbine jet uh, technology, we need to secure a better supply of biofuel, biojet for, a, 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 I would say a considerable amount of time at least. But we also need to look into electric aircraft, hybrid electric planes, and also hydrogen powered aviation. And we have to do all those things in a fairly short time. So we will see, I hope, and I, I estimate that we will see a lot of companies, both big and small and engaging in this necessary innovation. And they will have to push through their 
uh, innovations, their ideas, their aircraft, their engines, their materials through the certification process. And not only in one country, in one region, but everywhere, because we need the effects to be global, the positive effects. So uh, we know that EASA and the FAA amended CS23 some years ago to not block innovation for lower end of aviation. My call is that we have to do the same thing now, and we should better start now for also the bigger segments of aviation. And furthermore, we need to probably help our young uh, engineers already at university level to embrace the certification challenges, but not in a way that discourages them, but certainly more to encourage them that these things are important and we need to get these products as quickly and safely as possible on the market. And I also would like to uh, inv invite, in a sense, the operational staff that we have out there in the industry, be pilots or, or engineers or mechanics, to work with the uh, design and manufacturing industry so that we avoid potential problems uh, when we have a ready product on the market so that we can, again, enjoy the benefits of this. So very short to conclude, we have to quickly assess our certification procedures and processes and rules applicable today to ensure that the system that we have is not the showstopper for new and cleaner aviation. And secondly, we should reach out to young and promising coming engineers to make sure that they can keep their enthusiasm, understand the certification process and be ready to develop what we need. And four, we should engage our operational staff also in the certification process as early as possible. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, as we can see, we, we just can't overlook the importance of regulation and certification and accelerating new aircraft designs. And in fact, recently we had a call from Airbus CEO for a scheme to buy back clunkers, as uh, he expressed, which would remove maybe less efficient aircraft from operation, create jobs by maybe building the new machines and accelerate progress in innovation to save the planet, which um, seems to be a win-win on all sides. But maybe we, uh, we can pull uh, these sorts of discussions out as we venture into our panel discussion later on and find out how we can help uh, the CEO of Airbus, perhaps. Um, next, we have Hervé. A very great pleasure to have you here today, Hervé. Uh, and we're very grateful that Rolls-Royce has, through your involvement, been able to support this thought leadership especially whilst uh, they're managing the current extreme difficulties in civil aerospace. So over to you, Hervé. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got... Uh, thank you. So I should be unmuted. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, Shahid, I think we're just needing the slides yet. Can't quite see the slides yet, Hervé. Perfect. Thank you. And apologies to everybody and especially the organizers for being a troublemaker with the slides, etc. But um, with different firewalls and um, security uh, with our IT, uh, me accessing Zoom is a bit of a challenge. So if I'm shaking, it's because I'm doing this from my phone because none of my IT allows access to, um, to Zoom, uh, which we are not allowed to use uh, uh, for work purposes. So... I hope you can see my slides. I don't know if they can go full screen uh, now, and I still hope you're hearing me okay. Good, perfect, okay. So um, the, 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 the slide on my screen is about that size uh, because I'm using the phone, but I hope for you it's a lot better. So um, if we move to my uh, second slide or the first slide in the pack, please, then what uh, what we see is uh, uh, indeed uh, you know recognition that uh, basically our activities I think as F Frederick alluded to have an impact on 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 the planet have had an impact on the planet and will continue to have an impact and uh, at Rolls Royce uh, like in you know for all I think in the aviation and aerospace sector safety efficiency I think Frederick also mentioned that and competitiveness have always been at the heart of um, what we do. And indeed, we believe in technology and innovation to actually help us um, tackle what is the world's most important task uh, uh, at play today it was pre-COVID. And it will be when we uh, see the end of it, which is to find a way to live uh, more sustainably and enable basically society to achieve those goals. So if we move to the next slide, uh, uh, please. Um, I hope you can see that. 
the argument we, we are making, if we can move to slide number three, is that it's a complex challenge, complex problem. And I think that a uh, few companies are actually better placed than some of the incumbents who've been dealing with this to actually help uh, society transition towards that low carbon economy. And certainly as a business, we are very open in uh, our commitment to actually uh, uh, deliver uh, on to this net zero emissions by 2050. So if we can move to the next one, uh, again, I'm a little bit repeating what Frederick said, but it's, it's good to recognize that perhaps, though uh, I follow Frederick, I've never spoken to him, we seem to actually recognize that some of the challenges are the same. And society, uh, if we go to slide number four, uh, society has greatly enjoyed the benefit of uh, travel. I think in this COVID era, we all recognize uh, the benefits of connectivity. And if you're like me, we are all missing out on actually the freedom that that connectivity uh, uh, is, is, is giving us. But the challenge at play is that uh, demand for travel uh, has increased and continues to increase uh, significantly. There is more to it than perhaps the challenges that we've identified. And there is therefore more to do given the anticipated growth in demand. And we absolutely need to decouple emissions from that growth. And clearly, again, uh, as a stakeholder, we have a clear responsibility to cater for, for the growth, but in a sustainable way. And at Rolls-Royce, we uh, will be doing this through innovative technologies and engineering excellence, which I think have always been at the center of the company uh, uh, outlook and, and approach to things. So if we move to slide number five, um, this is just to illustrate that uh, uh, basically we have uh, uh, recognized this challenge at the most senior level. Our CEO has expressed uh, his views uh, very clearly on this. But uh, if we look at COP26 uh, and Nigel Topping in particular, the role that businesses such as Rolls-Royce can, can play is also uh, very uh, uh, clearly recognized. And though aviation is a force for good, and we see the benefits of connecting people, the benefits onto the economy, uh, in particular through these times of, of pandemic, uh, we also need uh, uh, to help manage that growth and transition towards sustainability. So if we can move to the next slide, I think it's probably one of the uh, first, uh, uh, perhaps uh, original contribution, I would say, uh, to this uh, panel discussion today. Original in that so far I've only reinforced what I think the previous speakers have said. But here is the uh, schematic, uh, simplified schematic of the relative impact of um, what we see uh, uh, to be the key contributing factors to those 2050 goals we want to achieve. And if you look at the sizes of the block, they roughly speaking, represent uh, what we see uh, basically um, uh, the significance of each contribution to be. Um, the greenish bit at the end, uh, as you can see, is uh, slightly fuzzy and, and hedges into the gray. That's because we would like to see a far greater role for sustainable aviation fuels to play in this and when we look at what we call market-based measures and offset, we see those much more at transitional, uh, time-limited sort of uh, uh, activities uh, to aid basically into the transition. Um, this is interesting from my viewpoint because the title of the seminar was Evolution versus Revolution. And, and I think that uh, in many ways, uh, because we will continue and need to continue to operate as we transition, we are talking about interventions and a change in the model that allow an evolution, a transition from where we are today to basically where we want to be uh, through uh, a mixture of uh, uh, measures. Uh, and some of that transition will be aided by uh, what I would uh, call uh, uh, intervention. And so elements around um, the gray side of um, my schematic will be particularly important. Uh, offsets uh, are, are, are interesting and we are, or you might be familiar with efforts such as, for example, uh, Corsia up to the mid 2030s. Uh, uh, but uh, we will need, you know, in, in the medium term, to uh, produce a solution that, allow, to, that allows us to operate 
in a fully carbon neutral fashion uh, uh, and eventually without the use of offsets. And the danger is that if we rely too heavily on offsets, then we, risk, we run the risk of suppressing the market for other methods of carbon neutral operation, and in particular, again, around sustainable aviation uh, uh, fuel. And in terms of taxation, which we sometimes hear about in aviation, uh, we need to recognize that aviation is a, a global industry and, and taxation would be quite difficult uh, 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 to put in place um, uh, um, across, across the world. And we do not see this as a full or optimum solution uh, in, um, in, in, in that particular context. So if we can move to the next uh, slide, it's a schematic that I often used. Um, I gave um, a STEM lecture at the Royal Air Force Museum in January, and I used that slide with uh, basically uh, uh, year 10 students. Uh, I think it's a very powerful uh, a schematic and it will, and it does explain why we see what we are seeing. Frederick talked about a range of solutions and uh, uh, we need to recognize that there is no one size fits all uh, but there is a number of potential solutions some of which will compete uh, around the market uh, economy and that competition is difficult to anticipate but uh, some of the challenges are very clearly captured on that screen notably with the red bars they if you think of an aircraft as a system uh, that is mainly based around uh, three dimensions your energy bill, your payload in green, and basically your roughly aircraft weight. This is how things fare when you move from a general aviation aircraft on the left, small four passenger type aircraft, to on the right, the sort of aircraft Paul flies, this is an A380 Paul, uh, uh, and in the middle you have the A320 class. And if you move towards energy solutions which are far less um, potent than kerosene is. Kerosene is 30 times more dense energy-wise than the best battery we have available today at pack level. Uh, um, you very quickly realize that if you substitute that energy on some long energy high power systems, direct substitution becomes nearly impossible. Uh, because you run out of mass fraction, you run, you run out of, of, of weight. And therefore this calls for um, a particular challenge for the civil or commercial aviation sector, where the fuel load is quite significant. Uh, it also limits some of the solutions that are available and or it forces uh, a, a revision so as to how we might need to operate and want to operate, in which case the service model as we know it today uh, needs to be revisited. The way companies, airlines, uh, uh, make money, the way customer experience their service is also in need of a change and that brings a further uh, 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 economic challenge including around uh, uh, infrastructure. So displacing kerosene is very difficult uh, uh, because of basically that potency, that power density that it packs uh, 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 compared to uh, novel greener uh, solutions. So if we move to the next slide this next slide is also one that I've used with year 10, so everybody should be comfortable with it. It's a very simple schematic. Um, I work in concept design, so we, are, we do big sums. We don't always do the, the, the very advanced detailed engineering because we are there to sketch out where the options might be. So again, if we move to that particular slide, what we see is that if you are in a low power, low mission energy uh, sector, Electric flight does make sense, you know, and in fact, if we think even about in terms of urban air mobility, the challenge might not be uh, at the power and propulsion level, it might be more at the control system level and in terms of the certification, safety element, public acceptance. These are really the challenges. Um, if we look at long haul aviation, Paul's airplane in his order on that particular slide, uh, um, uh, clear option is for sustainable aviation fuel, just simply because of the previous um, uh, uh, slide and, and the red bar uh, element. There is in fact nothing at this point that can uh, replace uh, uh, basically or displace uh, a synthetic fuel in that space. Uh, and you know, this is not simply Rolls-Royce saying it, others did our studies, perhaps some of the McKinsey recent work also highlight this. 
Now, in the middle, you've got an interesting space here uh, because you might say, well, how do, you, do, how do I augment the potency, the power pack uh, that battery gives me? Well, perhaps you can do this with an hybrid electric solution where you use a gas turbine and, uh, as an electricity generator, if you want, or you boost it with, with battery. Maybe you use a fuel cell with some hydrogen uh, to get into that space. Maybe uh, you start to use hydrogen as a direct fuel into the GT, uh, and that might work up to a point, perhaps for a single aisle aircraft, because they have the girth, the volume, they have a below deck storage to actually take that fuel on board, and very often they fly very short mission. But those solutions doesn't necessarily carry over across the whole range, certainly not into the medium range and long range segments. So this is why, again, we are looking at a range of options, some potential competitions being them, and not all of these options can be looked at equally in a simple matrix, because they are also, we must recognize, driven by external factors. For example, for hydrogen, perhaps the energy sector, perhaps the potential of an hydrogen economy that extends beyond aerospace, uh, uh, that might also play a role uh, uh, into this. So if we move to the next slide, please, slide number nine, um, the further reason for a key role to be played by sustainable fuels um, is shown and very clearly illustrated on that slide. And it, um, if you like, um, further reinforces what I've just said. It's really interesting to see that about, and I'm going to simplify here, one third, 35% of all fuel usage, therefore emissions, takes place in the below 1,000 nautical mile segment. Everything else takes place into basically far greater segment. And if you think about a single aisle aircraft with, say, hydrogen, it's difficult to, to imagine it perhaps flying, you know, very long distances. Uh, uh, and it's also difficult to imagine a large aircraft flying, you know, these sort of distances on, on batteries alone. So that uh, uh, further accentuates the need for some thoughts around synthetic fuel uh, uh, um, uh, for notably the wide body. But as you can see, for a significant uh, uh, fraction of the narrow body uh, 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 as well. And I think this chart is quite potent in showing that, uh, you know, we need to explore a number of options and that chemistry and fuels and, and combustion in particular still have a big role to play in, in, in delivering basically uh, over two thirds of, um, of, of the missions that we see. If we move to the next slide, slide number 10, please. Uh, uh, can I give you a, a one minute call, please, just to- uh, yeah. Is this my last slide? I think it is your last slide, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, yeah. So uh, if we look at it, uh, what is really interesting is of course with synthetic fuels, we could, basically cover the whole raft, the whole range of missions. Uh, we can see potential for electrification and hybrid electric from the bottom of my chart here. But we are also investigating other options. I've mentioned fuel cells with our uh, power systems uh, uh, team, for example. We are already actively involved in delivering fuel cell solutions. And also we recognize uh, medium to long term, a potential role in the short range to medium range segment for hydrogen as 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 a direct uh, as a direct uh, fuel. So um, this is about um, a range of options, uh, a selection of options which we need to understand and de-risk. But very importantly, also the recognition that all of this really extends beyond aerospace. It requires a change in terms of the energy supply, in terms of the availability of those fuels, which need to be manufactured in sufficient volume, notably for, for SAF. And if the whole aviation model is also changing, then there is a greater role to be played by institutions and, and society in enabling that uh, transition to uh, take place. So thank you very much. That was my pitch. Thank you very much, Hervé. And I think we can all recognise that power really is at the heart of all of our activities. And uh, some of the benefits of solving these, uh, these problems is the flow through that goes through into other industrial and economic sectors. Uh, so a reminder, please, that you can start sending questions in at any time using the question and answer link at the bottom, please. Moving on to Jack. Thank you, 
Jack, for joining us today. You have a tremendous and probably unique wealth of experience in bringing the aircraft to market. Please share with, with us your thoughts on the challenges we face in civil aerospace at the moment. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you Paul. Thank you, Paul. And, uh, you know, it's very humbling to be on this panel after seeing those last three presentations by, you know, some, some wonderful, brilliant people. And it reminds me of my first 20 years with the slide rule. But unfortunately, guys, the last 20 I've been in the corner office, so you might think I'm just overhead and not part of the, the solution set. Um, also, I'd like to just give a, a quick shout out to their three former colleagues on the phone and Bert Hunter, Professor Kapler and, and John Matz that I worked with a long time ago, who we had a lot of healthy debates and, and certainly were helped me in the formative years of, of really understanding this industry. And it's great to see them dial into this, this call. Um, I, I'm going to just share a few thoughts, um, not as well thought out with the great presentations that you've just seen. Um, I found that I really want to get a copy of them. They're very, very, uh, very insightful as to where we're going. And, and I wanted, since these are future leaders that are on the call, I guess I, I'd like to start by saying, as we're sitting here in July of 2020, you know, during a pandemic, uh, what, what is really going on in the aviation industry? And, and I, I'd like to start the discussion to create the thought and hopefully the, the dialogue that will come in the Q&A that I really believe we're, we're really gonna enter into a wave of significant growth and innovation in the aerospace industry in many, many different sectors. And you're probably all saying, oh my gosh, where's he coming from? <laughs> now, but now that I got your attention, let's, let's talk about why I see that may, may be happening. Well, you know, while we've been locked into this, we've all had our heads down. Um, we've been concerned about the realities and potential changes that are coming that have, center, have really come front and center as a result of this pandemic. And it really does impact and affect our thinking as we go, go forward. And it, it reminds me of a business fable that was written years ago in, in 1998 that was a motivational fable that was titled who moved my cheese and i think where we are at today is it's not about who moved my cheese it could better described as my cheese has been thrown out and what's going to replace it because now is really that time that that probably is going to occur as we ramp back up and looking at our product development plans and looking about how the world is changing and what are the what are the needs going to be you know, a lot of a lot of this discussion has been around sustainability, um, and it's it's about the, the the massive business transportation shifts that will occur as a result of trying to meet the sustainability requirement. I think probably as as we get into the discussion about it, one of the big factors that's going to drive the timeline and also uh, drive the the investment dollars is. Are we all going to get on the same page? And I'm speaking from my side of the pond who's not on the same page. So we have got to find a way to make sure that globally, this is a global problem and we need global solutions and we have to figure out, you know, how are we going to play in that with two major players in Boeing and Airbus being the drivers of that, uh, that change that will, will have to occur. You know, I think the timing of this, probably there'll be a forcing factor that we've never seen historically in our industry. Uh, here we are with, you know, a significant number of uh, airliners sitting on the ground, probably will never return to service. Uh, Paul shared some data with me that was uh, very enlightening of, of, you know, how do you get to the 2050 mandate? Part of the solution is we have to get rid of the, what I'll call the problem children, the aircraft that don't, uh, that aren't compliant and can't get there. And if you look at that, uh, Paul's data showed that the 787, the A350, uh, the A220, and the, the MAX, um, if we just put those aircraft back into service and nothing else, I believe, Paul, the, the number was we could get to 30% of the goal uh, for 2050. So the challenge I think that's out there is that, that Boeing and Airbus and, and the rest of the industry has to rethink their product development plans. And if we do you know, make those kinds of retirements and look at our product development plans going forward and look at them really consciously from addressing the 2050 need, along with a lot of other factors that were being surfaced as a result of the pandemic, which is efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. You know, when you have load factors that can't support uh, the economics of flying an airplane, how are we going to address the sustainability issue, which has an economic positive impact? 
along with the overall efficiency. I, I love the discussion about weight because in my product development days, the, the weight spiral was always a, you know, a critical issue that you chased as airplanes in the development cycle got heavier and you start throwing more thrust at it and you start throwing more weight at it. And before you know it, you, you have an airplane that's really not competitive or, or cost effective. But I think that's where we are today because there isn't going to be a demand for bringing the existing products back um, on production timelines. That I, you know, we can debate this all we want, whether you believe Airbus and Boeing are going to ramp up as they, they say they are. I don't believe the need is going to be there because there's already too much capacity. So does it cause you to take a pause? Does it cause you to say, I need to really throw out what had been the normal, what I'll call incremental development, uh, which was chasing markets, chasing them quickly, I think we could look historically at the A320 and the 737. That's exactly what those, those incremental developments were, is how fast can I throw um, some new technology, get it certified, get it to market, to take advantage of that, to take the full step back, because now there will be some time to redefine what that baseline needs to be. And you know, over the last 30 years, we never have had that luxury, having lived through all of that, I think if I were sitting in the situation of trying to address that, I would be sitting with my shareholders saying, this may sound abrupt, it may sound severe, but it is time to really throw out this incremental approach to things and start re-looking at clean sheeting the technologies and pushing the technologies and innovation that are necessary to get us not only to those goals, but necessary based on the lessons learned of what a situation like a pandemic does to the transportation industry, not only the commercial airline side, but the business aviation side and the general aviation side to design and solve for these problems. I think it's exciting. I mean, I think for young people in the industry, while well, it's important that they learn the historical issues that we face in being able to design and certify of airplanes and the hurdles that had to be overcome and not repeating uh, some of those, those lessons from the past, but to take an entirely different approach uh, from a, looking at it from an entirely different direction. Of course, it will be a question of, will the major investments follow? Will they understand that innovation does require time, requires a lot of money? But I think in the last 20 years of my life, the career, the, uh, the case can be made from a business perspective that the paybacks will be significant because we really will be making a, a major, major shift that could, you know, those who lead and, and get it and get there first um, will be incredibly successful with massive returns that we have not seen in this prior incremental uh, society. I think it was brought up in some of the other discussions as far as types of power sources, types of energies, types of materials, all of that plays into it. Along with from a young person coming into this industry, um, there's a segment that we, we haven't talked about today, but it's the, the UAS urban mobility sec segment that is still going to replace many of the transportation needs today that are being satisfied by the very conventional methods that we've all known for the last 80 years, whether it be helicopters or G airplanes or medevac or, or cargo, you know, what, what could be more inefficient and more eco or environmentally poor as a major freighter to, you know, a 747 packed with tons of, of stuff going around the world every day. Um, that has got to, we have to find new ways of, of looking at that infrastructure uh, from a transportation needs. And I think that's where the future is and that's where the exciting piece of it is. So my real question, not to, to carry on too long, as you can tell, I get very excited and, and motivated about this kind of stuff and these kinds of questions because I do think it's an opportunity and somebody's going to win and you, you want to be on that side. How do we get there? And, and will the capital follow it? Will there be a roadmap that we can, can, can show that there is a technology path to get there? Do we have the patience to be able to work through that? Uh, and part of this whole discussion and dialogue and, and certainly some of my background from a certification standpoint is, how are we going to certify these emerging technologies? And, and I come to that piece of it from the, the practical side of, we can all talk about hybrids, we can talk about different, uh, we can talk about electric, we can talk about a lot of things, but what we haven't done, and this is the challenge for the new leaders that are out there, is they've got to, got to jump in, forget about jumping in and, and 
figuring out how to maintain um, the status quo, how are we going to figure out the path to certify these new technologies when they're technologies that are absolutely essentially unknown to the certification authorities today? Um, and then we get into this whole discussion of how much is the regulatory body is going to allow industry to be a part of that solution? Uh, how are we going to collaborate globally to understand if, as that technology emerges, that there is a path to understand the certification needs? Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent that a lot of the certification authorities should be spending 60% of their resources on researching and being a part of the early adoption of the technologies as opposed to being a fast follower where you, you come on later. I, I, and we've all lived it, what, I mean, lived it from probably afar. I, I've lived it actually on the CJ for Citation 4 certification. Okay, one minute, please. Sir. Okay, of, lith of lithium batteries. You know, we come up with this great idea and then we hand it over to the certification authorities and say, what the heck's that? And we, you know, then the clock starts grinding along. So that's where the challenge is and I am done. Thank you, Jack. Um, everyone, I have to say, I, I, you know, I listen to these conversations and it's been such a pleasure, Ema and I, learning these and, and understanding it. It's so relevant. Um, and maybe, Jack, you know, you, you've made such good points and uh, also as your role as CEO of the Experimental Aircraft Association, hopefully in the panel discussion, we might, we might get a few little insights into what, uh, what you've uh, been looking at there. Now, last but by no means least, and I am looking at the time a little bit, folks. We've got uh, 40 minutes left. We want to get into the panel discussion, and uh, we want to hear some of the contributions from the audience by way of questions. But last but by no means least, we have you, Luke. Again, Luke, it's been a pleasure opening up these conversations with you, and I know Ema and I have really enjoyed your observations, particularly on finance. And we just can't get away from the, uh, the show me the money moment, really, for r and in aerospace. So perhaps if we could uh, ask Luke to share your views with us. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, especially for asking me to come off of mute. Usually, Bert asked me to go on mute during my speeches. So this is, uh, th this is special. Uh, I'm most likely gonna end up creating more questions than answers uh, similar to, to Jack. Uh, and I wanna begin by stage setting. You know, aerospace in our time, uh, the airframers uh, are down to essentially a, a duopoly. Uh, that, uh, that's not a value judgment. Uh, the world has duopolies. It has MasterCard and Visa, and it has Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and it has Boeing and Airbus, among others. Uh, it's characteristic of duopolies that they tend to be pretty efficient, but not terribly motivated to make changes to their products and uh, add to those characteristics the notion of being regulated to ensure safety, thank goodness. And it doesn't leave much room for either diversity or risk-taking. Uh, compare that to Silicon Valley. Uh, where it's much less regulated and much more risk taking and the risks simply don't carry the same consequences of failure. Um, however, those businesses uh, require productivity and profit and competition and investment. And uh, they're pulling from the same investment money that uh, we need to pull from. Uh, and therein lies the focus I want to bring to our discussion today. Um, how can we more effectively compete for the resources to bring socially meaningful innovation to the passenger? Uh, the technologies you heard about today to improve emissions all require investment, and that investment in turn has to be at least cash neutral or better yet accretive to the firm's financial performance. Uh, Without that, uh, any of us who have to stand up in front of our industrial analysts, investors, and boards of directors are going to struggle and have. Uh, one way of providing that incentive, of course, is by deploying a global carbon tax. Now, you could argue that uh, that eventually punishes the passenger, uh, but that's a bit of praying to a false god. Uh, all product spending, regulatory included, um, has to earn its keep in, in a profit-making uh, enterprise. Uh, there are uh, other non-regulatory uh, methods by which new technologies can be brought into the product, uh, namely new investor participation. Uh, the use of private equity and venture capital is interesting. It's become a standard practice in other industries. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the academicians 
uh, on this panel are familiar with that process. Uh, it, it seems to be much closer to their world than it is to the world of big business. Um, now, new companies are started, risks are taken, and as they mature and de-risk themselves, larger companies such as Google and Amazon, et cetera, uh, buy them and enhance their product offerings. Um, and I want to suggest that uh, that method of de-risking new technologies, even in a very highly regulated environment, hopefully becomes more common practice in uh, civil aerospace. Uh, uh, it may be that the technologies are initially deployed in applications where the risks simply bear less, uh, less harm, potentially. And, uh, and I th I here I'm thinking about drones, and I'm thinking about self-drive vehicles, and um, you know, all, all types of, uh, of process intense applications that perhaps, you know, the, the world of AI, the internet of things uh, used to accomplish new functions. Um, but it may also be faster and more efficient to do it that way and get it to market. It certainly has helped Silicon Valley. Uh, I recently heard from uh, participants in the private equity sector that there's over a trillion, with a T, dollars of investment sidelined awaiting for a home. Uh, they call it dry powder on the sidelines. It's a, a new vocabulary. And so why shouldn't that new home be aerospace? Um, I want to remind our audience that um, it not only improves OEM and airline profits, uh, this, this technology improvement, but the impact of civil that civil aviation has on the economy uh, and generating new ideas for investment are, are, are incredibly uh, improved. I mean, I'm pretty sure after all these years that the only new value uh, is created by bringing people together. And that's what aircraft do. Um, uh, it creates jobs. This technology has application beyond aerospace. Uh, the multiplier is what I'm talking about here in the economy, and it's significant. So everything we, you've heard here today, um, I hope comes to, to fruition, and I hope finds its way into uh, in, in, beyond aerospace. Uh, another way of looking at a vastly reduced emissions environment is that the costs we incur currently for cleanup and repair the damage, whether in the form of carbon tax or simply taking them into account, which we don't, life cycles are pretty, Brian reminds me, uh, life cycles are pretty, pretty tough thing to do. Um, it's not just tailpipe emissions, it's emissions associated with the development and manufacture of an aircraft. And it not only applies to carbon-based emissions, but the incredible amount of hot air that, uh, that is needed to bring a plane to market. Video conferences, phone calls. Uh, it's just anyone who's developed an aircraft could tell you, you know, half of the current process is just a lot of waste. And, and I really think some of the thought processes you've heard from the other panelists will help eliminate that. Um, there are many new technologies that enable meaningful change. It's always fun to find new inventions, but I suggest that the backlog of available technologies, uh, Jack Pelton and I have been staring at composites and, uh, and uh, you know, how, how do you replace stringers on aircraft? And, you know, we've, those discussions began at the beginning of our careers, not recently. Uh, you know, Could you know what you've heard of warning, please. Could offer yep. you a one minute warning, please. Yep, thank you. Um, so I personally think that the toolbox of available technologies is is dense and uh, and the notion of uh, hardware, firmware, software uh, is is mature enough to bring to the marketplace. Um, I, I believe that even in a duopoly where the need to innovate isn't always there, uh, opportunities for change exist, and I think we're proving that today. Uh, quite often the forcing function is competition. We need a forcing function. And, um, you know, Boeing and Airbus make decisions based on how they think each other are going to react. That's what duopolies do. But they also perceive the need for competitive advantage. 
So I'm pleased to see the efforts of people like Embraer and Bombardier and United Aircraft in Russia and the Chinese firms trying to bring aircraft to the market. I think that's a forcing function. Um, I think bringing new aircraft, new technologies, and, and, and new configurations to the market, uh, whether through Boeing or Airbus or not, is beneficial to the passenger and the businesses and the economy. Um, there are other forms of forcing functions. I believe we're living through one right now. I think the pandemic's a forcing function, and it's going to require new technologies to be brought in, maybe not related to emissions, but certainly uh, related to disease resistant air treatment systems and nanotechnologies, uh, et cetera. So, so put that in your, in your data. My, my final uh, forcing function is, uh, is a personal one. And I describe this as uh, evolution alignment. You know, uh, maybe it's time to start talking uh, the heathenistic notion of an open platform. I mean, Moore's law has eaten up more money that hasn't found its way into aerospace than probably any single competitor ever did. Uh, we have to find a way to get this stuff into the aircraft. Um, my, one of my first jobs was on the F-15 program as a software guy because no one could remember how to program in Fortran, which I had just come out of school and had been, you know, doing Fortran. Uh, these, are, these aircraft have old technologies in them, and I love the idea of, uh, of bringing new ones into them. Um, and I, I think that's, that's where I want to stop, Paul, but uh, thank you for uh, putting me last. It's uh, similar to a singer following Frank Sinatra on stage. That was, uh, was wonderful. Uh, but thank you, everybody. No, that's absolutely fantastic. And I, as, as of course, the moderating function is one mainly of time. And what I'd just like to say to you panelists, I think, uh, I think I'm right in saying, Herve, you're the most constrained. There's a, a chat function at the bottom. I'd like to overrun maybe by at least 10 or 15 minutes, but if you could just send me a little note on chat to let us know um, how your time sits, because I'd like to hand over to you, Ema, to start really the, the first of the interactive panel discussion. Of course, I'm good with time. You're good with time. Thank you very much, Hervey. Uh, Ema, you're on mute still. You're on mute. I'm off now. <laughs> thank you very much. Excellent. Good. Over to you, Ema. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for your talks today. They were uh, absolutely fascinating to listen to. I know we all had conversations beforehand about these topics and I really enjoyed them. I know you could probably all talk easily for an hour or two about your areas as well. Um, so I think I have a few panel questions which I wanted to put to the panel. Um, I think first of all I'm going to start with you Jack, if that's okay. Um, Jack, I, I was absolutely delighted to hear you talk about innovation and about the importance of bringing innovation back into the market. Um, not just because that's a personal interest of mine, but because I think it's highly relevant. Um, how do you think that we might start to facilitate the change of pace you talk about in innovation in commercial development? And do you think the current certification processes support this ambition? And what, what do we need to do, implement to get these technologies uh, in play? Thank you, Amber. I, I, you know, it's it's kind of I can I'm going to answer it from the from the back going forward because the comment okay. made about the certification process um, I think is problematic. I, I mean, I don't think it's responsive enough to the technology. And what I fear is it becomes the excuse as to why people may not pursue uh, pursue the technologies because they don't feel there's a certification path to get there. And that's why I'm so concerned and believe putting the efforts today up front on developing. A real roadmap that identifies what are the probable technology paths that we're going to go down and and creating the certification basis that will be supportive of that so the OEM or a, a, a supplier knows that there's a, a way to get to the end and I think that's that's really a, a, a constraint because it's easy to say I would like to do that but I don't know how to get there so I'm not going to go there and that's 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 the problem with capital allocation because you're gonna you're gonna say well I, I I, I, if I spend the money, I'm not going to get a return. Yeah, it, it is very difficult at the minute to make a, a viable roadmap because it's not based around uh, having innovative technology bring it into aerospace. Um, Frederick, I just want you to think about that question as well. I think that 
Um, with you, you're an expert in certification and certainly we do need to adapt it if we're going to change pace of development to bring innovation to market. Do you have anything to add? Well, uh, an expert in certification is probably not one of my usual four names, but <laughs> still <laughs> I have some years with the ASA and, and in the certification, let's say, authority. Uh, but I, I do agree that um, um, we, we have seen the regulators taking steps. It's not that they are not aware, aware of that. I have in front of me the, the uh, proceedings from uh, last year's EASA FAA International Conference, which uh, before COVID could be held, I think this year's was canceled. It was in June last year. And the, the whole theme of the conference was actually uh, certification, innovation, regulation. I mean, there was a, I wasn't there. It was a pity because I've seen the, the proceedings now and they're all downloadable on, on EASA's and FAA's web pages. And they, they had a plenary session on, on safety and the role of regulators, the challenges of technologies and, and uh, you know, all these uh, innovations that, that might be out there. And I think a common thread through these presentations and also in the outcomes from the, from the conference is that uh, we need to have a new way of, of not only maybe regulating or, or looking at certification and the process, but also of working together industry uh, with regulators, regulators between regulators and industry and industry. So mm -hmm. in all levels. And as I was uh, also discussing in my short uh, statements before, I, I do believe that we need to start very early to groom our new entrants uh, in, in the process because when they get out of university, our, our, our students, um, and in the professional life, they need to get started. They need to start working very quickly in the new, uh, in, in the new domains that we want to see progress. So I, I really think that we should, uh, when discussing, let's say, the total totality of the infrastructure that we need for this development to happen, we need to look at all these aspects. So it's yes, it's the regulatory process, uh, it's the certification process, it's the process how to train our engineers and how to include operational expertise in the process. And one last remark, we probably also should put, um, at least the, the, you know, on, on your university level, we should put uh, engineers together with, with regulatory people, or, or let's say candidates that would want to work in regulatory capacity later on, such as myself, lawyers, so that we don't later get these problems when lawyers and technicians don't have the same uh, language, because that will again, force us to slow down the process to explain everything and ultimately there is a liability sword hanging over our shoulders so get the judges and, and prosecutors in there as well it's a very big effort but we need to get through this so we i don't see any we can't take a shortcut here mm -hmm. yeah i agree the engineers need to be more savvy and certification certainly if we're moving towards um developing innovation and in a kind of sme model where engineers are up, up much closer to the certification process and aren't separated in the way they are in large firms. And um, th that moves me on to you, Luke. Uh, if we're looking at uh, changing certification and starting to develop innovation in an SME kind of format, um, we know, uh, talking to Brian, that we have, we have ideas and innovations, we have technologies that we are developing, they're there. Um, but when can we start engaging with private equity firms? When can we start approaching venture capitalists? At what stage of the process can we start to um, build or demonstrate our models and start to get these innovations moving? Uh, when they can't find a place to spend their money. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, but, but the, the answer is now. Uh, you know, there's no time like the present. Uh, mm -hmm. The pandemic's created a such novel situation for the world of investment. Um, mind you, I, I'm, I'm against regulatory practices until I get on the airplane. Then I think they're absolutely fabulous. Uh, so, so, you know, it, there's still the notion of going to venture capital, who, by the way, are used to new technologies. It's what they do. It's what differentiates them from private equity. You know, it's, they, they look for places to bring new things in and if, uh, if the engineers can provide a roadmap that's less risky and apply the technologies, uh, as we discussed in the world of drones, in, the, in a less risky environment and mature them to where we understand them better, 
uh, you know, testing and, and I think Brian's mm -hmm. point's great, but he, you know, t to go from the real world to a simulation world, you need data. And it's hard to collect enough data uh, to get to a statistically meaningful number. Uh, so you need methodologies like that to, to, you know, get your hands on what's really happening uh, but I will tell you right now, uh, people would love to hear from a community like this. Uh, they would more like to hear from young people because they're used to young people coming into their offices and talking about, uh, Jack, I, I, I don't think they're waiting for you and I, um, I, I, I think they want to see, they want to see young, highly talented, uh, engineers come in uh, very excited about their technologies and then work with them. You know, they'll provide solutions as well. They'll tell you, let's try it here. Let's try it there. Let's bring it to this. Let's bring it to that. And solutions, uh, that process will generate solutions. You don't have to know everything up front. But just getting started, um, I, I think there's a great thirst for bright engineers to come and talk to them now and you know whether it's london or new york or la you know th th there's a plethora of, of places to go thanks thanks luke we're, we're going to ask you to email shortly to go into the q a session for the the um our audience but just before we do that i mean i i'm interested to pick up on that luke because brian and hervey both of you are working in technology areas that that are so relevant one in weight and one in power so um, perhaps you could uh, sort of contribute to which uh, which technologies jump off the page that you think venture capitalists might like to uh, like to sit down and listen about. Uh, maybe to you, Hervé, first, please. So I'm going to demute myself uh, on, on on this one. Um, well, I, I think as I've shown, there is not one size fits all. There is not one solution that jumps out of the page. Uh, I was very interested in the certification comments. Uh, and in particular, for example, in some of the more recent rewrite of some of the certifications, because they actually make things even more difficult for some of the new technologies, interestingly, and, and would render some of the certification of uh, those aircraft near impossible today. So there is something there uh, 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 to be done. Uh, there isn't one that obviously jumps at me because they are not necessarily comparable. Um, one obvious one would be uh, a fuel because you can then continue to use some of the technologies you, 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 you have. Um, there is an opportunity around that whole chain for fuel production and how do we actually put things in place. We've been looking at, for example, uh, developing things around uh, our SMR solutions, small modular reactors. Uh, and there is a, a kind of a suite there that is available to actually uh, uh, develop um, uh, maybe options that would be indeed very attractive to to uh, to, to 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 investors. Um, in looking for some of these solutions, we, we often have a series of hype cycles, and we've seen quite a few of the. The, the, the recent past, um, we haven't yet, I think, got um, a silver bullet and maybe because, uh, except for a fuel, it doesn't really exist. Okay, thank you, Hervé. Over, uh, Brian, is there anything that jumps off the page that you'd like to sit down or some of your um, people you work with at, uh, at university, you'd like to put them down in front of there, the, there, the, there is a There is a lot happening um, uh, within advanced structures research in terms of uh, not just simply in development, but in, in, in the operational aspect. You know, how do you create a self-healing composite, for example? How do you create a system um, where you can uh, improve on the, you know, the A, B, C, and D checks or whatever equivalents come in? You know, can, can we have uh, just-in-time maintenance uh, through uh, onboard structural health monitoring? Um, but something interesting that I think it was either Luke or Jack mentioned about when you started your careers talking about uh, stringers and composites. And I think that is the problem, that if you look at an airframe of 40 years, you know, I'm not saying you guys have been in it 40 years, but I'm just saying go back decades, our aircraft still look the same. And yet we get all these uh, futuristic images from Airbus um, of aircraft which have more of an organic structure 
or the latest, which more looks, you know, with with the wingtips, with a, with with a morphing wingtips, and um, uh, you know, so so so, you know, there is there is this 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 connect. There is a there's an inherent conservatism in uh, aircraft design, even though we're meant to be, you know, uh, excuse the pun, leading edge. With certification, um, there is a much more complex relationship between the certification bodies and the OEMs and the manufacturers. And, I, and we, you know, because especially when it comes to, to the media, um, you know, what we hear about um, is an unhealthy relationship sometimes between an OEM and, and uh, say, you know, I don't want to pick on the FAA, but if you hear about a, a number of incidents, uh, not, um, you know, 737 MAX, um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the 787 uh, uh, Japan Airlines uh, fire where uh, uh, part of the NTSB talked about uh, an unsatisfactory oversight by both Boeing and FAA on that. Um, we heard the same thing uh, from a report which was released a couple of, a, a few months just before the 787 made its maiden flight when the government accountability officers re uh, released a, a report which talked about the FAA's um, uh, oversight of uh, the safety of composite airframes and, and that made for uncomfortable reading. Um, so I guess there's a question here, where does that, does, you know, um, is that relationship right? Um, uh, is, is, is that part of the issue? Ryan, could I, uh, we're going to go to Ema to questions now, I'm just conscious of time again. Um, Jack, just come back very slightly. You see probably a lot of inventions coming through uh, experimental aircraft in your CEO role there. Maybe just in 30 seconds, could you just give us what technology you'd like to see in front of a venture capital that you see uh, really making a difference? I, um, I mean, currently sitting right in front of us is the electronic electric technology or combination hydrogen uh, electric combination. And and again, this is it gets back to the perfect example of we don't have a regulatory uh, environment set up with how to how to how to certify that. So, in light aircraft, the ASTM standard, which would be very quickly, you could apply electric technology for that kind of mission. I mean, the technology is actually exists today. There's not a path to certify that. They they left that out when they created the ASTM standard. They only addressed standard reciprocating gas engines. They didn't address turbine engines. So we, one of the things we see in the experimental side, which is exciting, is, is a lot of innovation occurs that the technology then becomes applicable for commercial applications at a later date. So we're seeing that, and that's what I think, what we're really encouraging and innovating. We've done, uh, in avionics, for example, we created a path to take a non-certified avionics system and found a, a, a way around the rules, to, but we did apply to the rules, to... Uh, a certified airplane to actually put those air avionics in there, which is an enormous cost reduction, enormous safety, enormous safety enhancements of the cockpit, uh, and, a, and a new big market, which is great. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, Jay. I mean, I, I don't think we can not mention Elon Musk in the context of some of the things we're talking and what he's managed to deliver regarding the, the changing cost of putting a kilogram in space. And maybe it's that level of technology change that we're, we're trying to think about here. But uh, let's move over to Ema. I mean, we've had a very uh, engaging conversation amongst the panelists, but uh, I'm sure the audience have got some cracking questions that we'd like to uh, offer to them. So would, have you got any of those uh, raring to go, please? Yeah, we do. Um, we've had quite a few questions in from the audience, so I'm just going to go back to the start. Um, excuse me if I read out your question incorrectly or uh, get any of the meaning <clears throat> out. Um, I, I think the first question, interestingly, is in a completely different topic than we've really addressed in our talks, and it's to do with leadership. It's from John Matson. Um, he says, this seminar focuses on new leaders. When you reflect on the three or four generational cycles you have seen in civil aerospace over 30 plus years, what are some of the recurring issues you see in each generation of leaders and what what would what's the best lesson to learn each time and i think that question is best for luke um uh, on a personal note I, I think we've confused managing with leading mm -hmm. um we spend so much of our time you know I I uh, trying to make decisions uh, and not enough time leading our people, providing them support. You know, it's not really about us. It's about them and what we can do for them. 
So if we could kind of sway the bar a bit away from uh, getting engaged in the process of managing and a bit more time on the process of motivating and enabling uh, people, especially at this point of transition that the industry's at, it's, you know, it's simply not about us anymore. It's about the 25 year old engineer who wants to invent new things. So that's, that's where my head is at. Yeah, I think it is, it's a difficult task trying to inspire and uh, motivate people as well. And that is, that is definitely different than some of the management that, skills which we are taught, which are also essential, that do miss out in those leadership skills. Some people have that naturally, and, uh, but most of us need to be told how to do it. Um, thanks a million, Luke. Um, next we have Vasily. Uh, he is asking a question on emissions. Uh, Brian, you're absolutely the man for this one. Uh, he's asking, will the level of emission or the environmental impact during manufacture and testing increase with the composite material application in the aircraft industry? And if you're able to, he's asking, can you give a rough estimate? Have you <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. No pressure there then, Brian. No pressure. And your mute still on. Yeah, your mute still on. Yeah, yeah, give the number. <laughs> so operators of, of the, uh, the 350 or the 787 tell us that they are reporting, a, um, a, well, so the manufacturers are telling us that a 20% reduction on, on weight or, uh, compared to an equivalent aircraft. And there's a commensurate saving apparently in operational costs uh, being reported by the, uh, by the, uh, by the operators. Um, so th th there's certainly a, a, a reduction. I think as someone pointed out earlier, we have a mixture of aircraft flying right now. If we were all on the later generation of aircraft, we would go a long way to meeting some of these targets. Um, the, so, so, yeah, the later generation of aircraft and for, for um, uh, Hervé also mentioned, you know, the, uh, and others, the tremendous um, achievements in, 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 in specific fuel consumption over the years. Um, or, you know, so it's not just, it's not just the weight of, of, uh, of the airframe. Um, the, going back to manufacturing and the cost of manufacturing, yeah, there is an issue with carbon fiber. Uh, even over the whole life, life cycle because of the, the recyclability issue right now. That, you know, if we have every aircraft being made out of carbon fiber and an epoxy resin, that creates an issue in terms of, uh, in terms of end of life. And, and uh, even though that's an, that's an active area of research right now, where people are looking at what you want to do when we talk about recyclability, you don't want to change an aircraft structure into a park bench right? You want to maintain the, 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 the high level of reusability as much as you can. So ideally, you'd want to recycle uh, a bit of aircraft to create another bit of aircraft, right? Um, we're not there with, uh, with composites. Um, the, the, uh, um, we go back to certification because it's a relatively complex material. The, the certification route is quite expensive because of the amount of testing that you have to do. Just to give you a, a, um, an anecdote, um, talking to my Bombardier colleagues down the road, they tell me that at one stage for the C series, which became the A220, 70% of all composite laboratories in the UK were doing some testing for them. Right? So, so um, that, um, can I, um, I'm just, you know, in moderator, I'm, I'm between the devil and the deep blue sea here. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like to raise the ante a bit, because just because I think we've got a, a number of really good questions. And, you know, we're coming up to 23 minutes. So what I'm going to say is you've got, can we just set a 60 second limit? And Ema, if you could just try and blast through a few of these questions and just see, just try and hit all the, uh, the panelists as hard as you can. And, and just, um, you know, panelists, if you, uh, if you don't mind sort of being put under pressure that you've got to really uh, tighten it up, that's not trying to uh, undervalue your contribution. I think it's trying to get through the, the value that we have of people listening in and, and trying to recognize and, uh, and uh, appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, well, thanks a million, Brian, and thank you for getting some numbers out in that as well. That was uh, truly impressive. Um, we have a question from Paul Pereira at DKN. Um, for, this is for you, Hervé, regarding a power density of fuel cells. He says, if we can see the ground and logistics section of the market choosing the balance of plant with five uh, kilowatts per kilogram, could this take the range of a single aisle to 2,000 kilometers with 165 paxels to zero carbon emissions, including... Uh, Nitrogen, nitrogen oxides and contrails? I don't know. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah, so I think that we have sight of um, how fuel cell can develop. We have to be careful not to believe too much in the hype cycle and, and mm -hmm. be wishful thinking. Uh, uh, so we have a, a sight of that development. Um, increasing the power density is central to that. Uh, there are uh, options that are directly linked to the light weighting of the stacks which are clearly important. Uh, there are also uh, alternative uh, 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 routes we are pursuing to increase that power densities, um, some of which, we, again, we have clear option on, but I'm not going to mention uh, 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 today. I apologize for that because we are currently looking into them. So there is clear sight. Just need to be careful not to be hyping things when we don't necessarily uh, see that. Um, with fuel cells, a, a further challenge, as I said, is, is linked to their performance. They don't like big variation in power, in power requirements, so they are a good base load. Uh, and for example, if you look at part 23 and you start to do some uh, uh, analysis, you realize that some of the latest requirements in the rewrite would make life quite difficult. So there is in particular part 23 rule 2120, Part, uh, B part three, which is a requirement around basically uh, a go around upon uh, approach, which makes life really difficult and pushes you to potentially uh, have to oversize your fuel cell and carry quite a big amount of technology around it. So certainly for um, auxiliary power, certainly on some small aircraft operation, there is some potential we need to study clear sight of things we can do to increase the power densities, but it's not necessarily uh, yet clear cut as a solution. And there are challenges uh, with the certification with some of the recent rule rewrite, uh, which would pose a challenge for some of those aircraft. Okay, oh, thank, thanks very much, Hervé. Um, Jack, I have a question here for you uh, from Michelle. Uh, what do you see the greatest risk started the aerospace industry to fail to reach global emissions by the 2050 or actually the 2030 target, which people are talking about now as our tipping point? I, I think it goes back to everybody buying into that. I mean, I, I don't feel on our side of the pond, this is even a topic that ever even comes up. And mm -hmm. until, really? yeah. So, and, you know, until we get into, um, you know, a collaborative approach, buy into that this is the goal and we start working on it. I mean, I think, and maybe maybe we're just sitting here arrogantly thinking the engine manufacturer will solve this for us by you know, creating these incredibly efficient engines that will, will solve for it. But, um, you know, we, we've got we to collaborate on this and, and buy into it. And um, unfortunately, there's politics and, and accords that, that uh, are, we're not, we're not at the table at, and that's unfortunate. Oh my God, that's quite surprising to hear that. And, and so, you know, and so as a result, I mean, I think the harsh reality will be a U.S. carrier is going to head across with a passenger full of airplanes and they're not going to be welcome to land. And right. finally, somebody's going to wake up and say, okay, now I think we got an issue because you just took a market away from me. Oh, my goodness. Well, that, that's quite surprising to hear that it's going to reach a kind of a, a, a crisis point before an, any kind of movement happens, politically speaking. Um, thanks a million, Jack. The next question is from Stephen Hawkins, uh, and he is asking about leadership. Um, I'm probably put this one to look actually, because you were talking about this before, and I know that you're very interested in this. Um, he was asking about any, what do you think the main leadership issues were in what happened with the 737 MAX without, without getting into any of the technical problems that happened? Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's leadership. I mean, I get the idea of bringing your product to the market, uh, to try to trump your competition and doing everything you can to reduce that time. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, uh, you know, is that mean spirited? Uh, did that cause a failure? Did some leader say, you know, forget the steps in the process. I'm going to do that. I don't think so. I, I think we've created a process that's difficult to get through. And every now and then you're gonna take some risks to get your product to the market. And the system broke at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I I'd love to hear Frederick's answer to that question. He's probably, you know, well, maybe uh, has a be better understanding. 
maybe that's something that uh, that we can do. I mean, these are quite uh, these are quite interesting discussions, but I think all airline manufacturers wrestle with this combination of commercialising a product, whilst at the same time trying to bring it to market in a timely way. And uh, I think, from an aviator a pilot's perspective, we do have safety that sits at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. But in trying to, you know, the context of this webinar is, you know, how do we accelerate discussion? And I think part of what sits underneath this is a conversation about risk and how we manage risk going forward and the human interactions that sit beneath it. Maybe there's a, a little spin off that we were talking out about uh, what, what uh, you were mentioning there, Luke. Um, Frederick, you'd like to just to come in and uh, maybe just comment a little bit on that one. Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, when we talk about leadership, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure, and, and also being aware of, of some organization that I work with or, or had uh, cooperation with, you know, the kind of leadership that we need is, is uh, on every level. Um, so we need it, uh, and in, in, let's say in every segment or every discipline. So you need in the technical field, you need in the legal field, the regulatory uh, field, and so forth and the political field as well or at least semi-political i'm talking about the global institutions for example like chaos uh, we have to really discover um, that together uh, and one thing um, you know we, we are in the business of of uh, risk mitigation in one sense but we are certainly in the business of confidence and and in the business of confidence we we are struggling now i think and we, if we are not getting through this we will have COVID and, and the disease situation uh, or the, the contagious disease situation. We have the climate change. We have some certification is issues that we are still, you know, uh, somewhere in the back with the 737 MAX. And we are talking to a number of actors here. We have the public, we have the politicians, we have investors, and we have future people that would like to start maybe, or we would like them to start working in the business. And all of these must feel confident that this is the industry to put their money, their interest, and their energy in. That's the huge challenge. And, and we need to really have a, I'm advocating this total picture. That's, that's I think, one of the lessons I learned from this discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frederick. Um, how are we doing for time, folks? We've just passed the, what, the hour and a half. I'm really enjoying the interaction. I think we've still got a bunch of, of interesting questions. Are we okay for another 10 minutes? Can we, can we have a nod around the table? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Ema, right, uh, over to you, thank you. Excellent, I'll fire through these questions. I can see actually, Jack, that you answered a question in airships that I wanted to talk about because uh, they're a particular interest of mine, but uh, since, since you've answered it and we're very short of time, we'll just move on. Um, Brian, I have a question for you regarding certification of composites uh, from Umberto Almeida. He is asking, um, what extent is the certification procedures linked to the behaviour of the composites and mechanical behaviour? Um, and uh, he says, for instance, the American Air Force retains that certain regions of place that are metallic. Um, how do you see the future of composite materials and structural components in civil aircraft? You're muted, Brian. So we have, you know, as, 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 as we know, we've got now, we've got uh, the, 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 the 350, the 787, we've got the slightly smaller ones, the, the 220 has composite wings, you know, and, and again, we're very proud of that because the, the wings were uh, resin, uh, it's a new technique, uh, resin infused, uh, resin film infusion down, and down, down the road from here. Um, the, so there's a, the, you know, the, the, there's a lot of, um, um, the de-risking uh, occurs through the extensive testing that we do um, that, that we do in composites. And, and what I've tried to say in a very in, in, in a very short time is that we just need to reduce the cost of of, of certification, the cost of, uh, um, of of developing these new airframes. But we need to move beyond that because we are still to the to a great extent developing airframes, um, not quite a black metal design. But we still have our stringers, our skins, our, our, our frames, um, and if you look at a at a wing, um, at a structure of a wing, it doesn't look too different to what we've done in metals. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's how we move beyond that to 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 deliver on what uh, what governments and 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 the public are demanding of us in terms of coming up with uh, disruptive uh, technologies and disruptive designs that will give us the reductions that we are seeking. Um, so, um, and of course, don't forget the industries, you know, the, the, the duopoly that Luke talked about, they've now invested heavily in, in these types of uh, composite aircraft. 
Um, there's a whole issue of even material qualification, because now that we've got Airbus and Boeing having invested so heavily in carbon fiber and a specific range of resins, don't ask them to change the fiber or the resin anytime soon. Um, uh, so, so there are these issues, and 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 of course, you know that that the, the, they another you know not quite certification, but even material qualification uh, needs to be looked at. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, it's, it's quite a dynamic area at the minute. I think we've moved in the last ten years. We've moved on enormously in our understanding of how these materials behave. Um, in fact, you've um, just you've just unmuted. Have you got a little point to come in on there? No. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, right. oh, come in. No, thank you. Off you go, Ian. Um, so we have a question on uh, funding and certification changes globally. Really, I think this is a question for Frederick, really from Gunther, um, or Jack, whoever wants to answer. Um, talking about um, how the current firms, uh, the big duopoly we have that Luke was talking about, aren't willing to invest in innovative technologies at the minute. Though I suppose that's maybe debatable. Um, Gunther is wondering, is there a potential for this to be funded by Chinese companies? And when do you think that China will have a certification body similar to the FA FAA or EASA, which will really change how their aero technology develops? Um, I'll put that to Frederick first. Okay, I think I, I will have to give an open answer because I honestly don't know. I think the, uh, you know, we, we've seen developments in China. There is also uh, bilateral agreement with uh, between uh, EASA, EU, and, and uh, Chinese uh, friends on, on aircraft certification. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, there's a growing um, confidence, I think, in, in, in what they can perform. But at the same time, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we need to uh, engage the whole world to get what we need. Uh, so we need to find ways for uh, for knowledge sharing, experience sharing, uh, risk sharing probably as well, uh, which brings me to the investor side of this. Uh, so, uh, I mean, as I said, we are in the business of confidence and, and uh, although I don't like to say, it, but at this very moment, we are a bit uh, scuffed there in some corners and, and we need to uh, uh, improve there. And I, I really call on our global and regional leaders to make sure that this does not become an issue of regional or international, uh, let's say, competition to the expense of innovation. It has to be the other way around. And this is, again, a leadership issue. We can, we can have all the best engineers in the world. And if the leaders are not realizing this, then we are in a problem. Um, Thanks, really. Yeah, can I just uh, interrupt? Because actually the leadership issue is, it's not just about an aerospace. The, the problem we face as a, as a sort of species is that, that we've got a problem with our energy density, haven't we? And we need to find a way of packing more yeah. of the, that we don't burn in chemical terms into stuff that we can fly around the planet. So, um, Hervé, Rolls-Royce seems to be involved in stuff that sits off the aeroplane but might be relevant to the air environment. Have, have you got a comment on maybe the MTR technology or the uh, Well, it's clearly, you know, we are very keen to encourage, you know, every possible way in which, you know, some of the drop-in fuels can be produced and, and, and we certainly wish to encourage that market. Uh, we are looking at uh, 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 ways to deliver. It's not simply the power. There is a power density as one element. There is also the energy um, uh, through the stream. And it's true that with options such as, you know, small modular reactors, we could uh, find a way of producing low carbon fuels and, and deliver basically that, that solution to, uh, uh, to, 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 to the market for the aviation uh, uh, sector. I mean, some of the points that um, were interested, interesting to me in the previous comments were along the, times, the time cycles, but as part of this, there is also the investment cycles uh, required to actually bring these solutions forward. Uh, uh, and therefore, I think that this may also explain uh, uh, why uh, uh, there is a, sometimes a, a degree of conservatism. I think it's Brian Falson who mentioned um, uh, basically the investments involved in some of the uh, uh, composite materials, and, and that is true to the suite. We also need to remember that we've got thousands of products 
which are currently in service and available, and they won't simply be switched off and replaced instantaneously. So we also need to find a way in the context of this evolution versus revolution to actually transition some of those assets, some of which, especially on long range, are quite new products uh, and find ways to basically uh, keep these highly efficient GTs and, and aircraft in service. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Um, again, uh, I'm, I have my mind as an airline pilot. My whole life lives around getting the, the brakes off on time for an on-time departure. So um, we've, we're, we're coming towards an on-time closure, but not actually. Um, now, what I'd just like to propose is we've probably got time for a couple more questions, I hope, Ema. And so I'll pass you over maybe for if you could pick a, a couple of really nice, uh, interesting ones that we've got maybe uh, just a minute or so. And then um, obviously we I'd like to offer Jack, I think with your experience and wealth of knowledge of the number of aircraft that you brought to market. I'd, after Ema, we've last, taken these last couple of questions. I'm gonna hand you over maybe for a little bit of a summary if you would about what you think um, from your experience you, you'd do in the next you know, couple of years um, to, to really make a difference on this subject. So if you could hold that thought back, Jack, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I think you, your experience is really, really valuable. But if I could just pass you over to Ema maybe for maybe a last one or two questions and then we'll, we'll hand it up to Jack to, uh, to just summarise. Okay, I, po I apologise to everybody who's questions that we didn't get to, but I'm going to choose another couple on areas that we haven't spoken about yet. Um, I think one of them is very topical. Um, there is a question here from Edward Farmer, if I can find it. And he says, it's, uh, I think this is probably for Hervey. I'm going to say Hervey or Brian. I'm not sure who would have the answer to this. Uh, just shout out if you feel you want to answer. Uh, he says, speaking as a biologist and a private pilot, what is the panel hearing about air cleaning and other filtering technologies to help uh, scrub viruses out of the air in an aircraft since COVID-19 is not going to be the last one? Um, he's asking about retrofits and certification, how that's going to take place. So I don't know, if, Brian. Are we talking about air circulation in the cabin? Air filtration in the cabin, yeah. There is yeah. air filtration in the cabin already. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I guess um, it, it's interesting because as, um, uh, for those who don't know, um, uh, we're part of a UK Aerospace Research Consortium. And, um, and the, um, the Aerospace Technology Institute recently asked us the same, very same question in terms of biosafe flight. Mm -hmm. um, so, so looking for, for potential research projects. So, you know, how do you design... Um, uh, anti-pathogen surfaces on aircraft, for example, um, you know, and there's all these ideas of, of you know, uh, photo-activated uh, antiviral surfaces, you know, um, even, even whether there's any, any, any PPE that, that can be worn. Um, so, yeah, so, so um, not much has been done in this area because it is very much a, a, a game changer, but certainly it's something, it's a, these are questions that are now being asked. You know, if we if we are going to move in this in this uh, new reality, we need to look at aircraft from a biosafe perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think certainly uh, as uh, Edward said, he said that COVID won't be the last virus. So hopefully, in the next few weeks, we're going to see some big developments in how we're addressing COVID uh, with a word of a vaccine on the horizon. So um, what, uh, what we can say, Ema, I mean, from a pilot's perspective, I, I obviously get fed information about this, um, the recirculating aircraft. And I think uh, the, the travelling public should be very confident that the circulation, the HEPA uh, filters that are fitted on the, the modern aircraft are very good and they will filter out these viruses. So I think this is something that maybe is not necessarily well, well talked about, but certainly is something that is well understood by the airlines and the airline industry. Um, thank you. Sorry, Ema. Over to no, you. Okay. Maybe we should have mentioned that HEPA filters are standard in air filtration systems and aircraft um, to give people some confidence. Um, the next question is a bit of an out there one, although I'm just bringing it up because uh, it is a question that I heard asked more than once as an undergraduate doing aero engineering, but it is a relevant question. <laughs> the answer to which is can give some insight. It's from Gunther, and he says, with new aircraft design, we do not need windows anymore. Everybody looks at movies on their smartphone and to make the right lighting and environment for everybody to move around. Perhaps this is something we should be considering. Uh, Brian, actually, you're probably the good one to answer that. Being there. Well, Luke, I think maybe. Luke, let's bring Luke in for um, on that one. I think I, I saw Luke 
chomping at the bit to have a comment on really? that. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, you're muted. Oh, you're, you're, you're muted, Luke. Yeah, thank you. There we go. There we go. Uh, yes, no windows. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Paul? Jack? Paul, you, you, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly biased because I used to work uh, at the Nottingham Aerospace Technology Institute, but you will know that the human factor group there uh, actually works on, on uh, some of those issues and, and passenger perceptions. So it's not novel, it's not new. People are looking uh, around immersive experience for the passenger as a way of replacing perhaps those windows. Now I'm talking about this as a, uh, a former academic, not as a Rolls Royce person, but uh, there is work ongoing in this area, yes. Yeah, no, and I think it's certainly for lifting bodies and different aircraft shapes, um, it's a really relevant question. Um, Jack, I can see you putting your hand up. I'd yeah, like just to just what on, on Professor Kapler, you know, who again looks way down the road, and, and I, the question on the windows, I did see a presentation by Embraer uh, as to what they view the future over the next 50 years, and their airplane has no windows in it, and it's really? standing, it's using human factors and issues to put a passenger in a calm environment with um, beautiful, beautiful types of scenery and stuff that uh, is was really appealing. But they they have that in their advanced design activities. Interesting. Um, so I think really it's time to for me to start sort of wrapping this up. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. Jack, have you got? Um, sort of like a little summary. You've seen so much in your uh, career in aviation. You've brought so many products to market. You have, in a way, um, tried to navigate the future, generate uh, to cash to invest. What would you say to the audience that's uh, sitting out there? Um, what would you encourage them to think about and to focus on in the next sort of year or, or two post-COVID? You know, I, I think there's two areas that I'd, I'd highlight, and it's, I think, a lot of the panelists have, have hit on these topics from the design side to the to the capital side. I think from the design side is we have to now use this as an opportunity when we lay out a new program. We look at design to weight, we look at part count, we look at design for manufacturing, we look at tooling. We have to make certification an equal partner in all of those initial upfront uh, advanced design concepts and, and make that an equally weighted, valued piece of the development process, um, where it's quite often an afterthought and, and leaves our certification people at a disadvantage. It gives them, I think, as from a career standpoint, a seat at a table in a very important role. And the other piece of that is it has to have the parameters of new technologies are going to be implemented on any new product going forward. My segue for that is shareholders have to be able to recognize and reward companies that are investing in new technologies and in innovation that does not have the short-term payback, but a publicly held company gets penalized for using that kind of capital because it's not getting the return, um, you know, the next quarter or the next quarter. And we have to find a way to change the reward system for companies that are doing that. Thank you, Jack. And that's a, that's a great summary. I think, uh, thank you so much, all the panelists for joining us and for the audience. Um, a last, uh, really just comment that we've got uh, Professor Dr. Gunter Kapler. I know, Jack, you've mentioned him, but I think uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here today, sir, to listen to us. You're a, a receiver of the Royal Aeronautical Society Gold Medal, and you're an expert on certification. And I'm sure, hopefully, you've got some comments that you can pass on to Bert after this. Um, so panelists, um, we'll, we'll get to the wave bit shortly. We're going to put up a slide which really just says the next um, webinar that we've got. It's a series of five, as I say, the next one is space. Uh, we'll put up a little uh, slide just to remind everybody when that is uh, and how that's going to play out. In the meantime, Ema, could you just uh, say, say a few words from your perspective and then we'll, we'll just get the panelists to, to wave and say cheerio. Just wanted to say thank you to everybody today for coming and delivering your talks. It was so interesting to uh, listen to and also the pre-talk discussions as well, which were absolutely fascinating for me. Um, and thank you for the question and answer session, which I really enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um,
Well, I think really it's, it's come to that time. I'd like to, uh, to carry on this for, for quite a while, but we have got, uh, have got time pressures. I know, Hervé, you've got, uh, got something pressing going on in the background. Uh, for the audience, thank you so much for uh, logging in this afternoon. It really is a great pleasure to have an audience and to hear these discussions about maybe your future careers and maybe in some small way we've helped you. With, uh, with your thinking and your development on that. The next uh, Generation Leaders uh, webinar is on the 21st of July. The subject is space and space role in tackling the Earth's challenges. So if we could just do a, a Zoom cheerio, folks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Nice seeing everybody else. Okay.